Hi, this is Paul. Been a variety of really good videos out quite recently about the cluster of consciousness, levels of consciousness, relevance realization, uh, categorization, these, these types of questions. And um, I want to play some of them and hopefully make them a little bit more intelligible. And let's begin with this recent one on Plato's Cave, The Matrix and AI that John Verveke was on. And this was not on John's channel. This is on a smaller channel, Lantern Jack, uh, 300 views so far. But the I think the clarity of this video, you know, John's been obviously talking about this stuff for a long time. One of the points that... Jordan Peterson made to um, Glenn Lowry was that university professors tend to see a lot of very smart people and the average level of intelligence education that they see while well, they've qualified to enter university. I think some of the work that John has been doing in terms of talking to other channels has helped him, or maybe I've just know more now, so I hear it more clearly, um, talk about these um, issues in a clearer way. Let's first start with the question of categorization. Now, now why is this? So I think you'll do a good job of explaining it. One of the things I teach about, one of the things I do work on is how do human beings categorize? How do we do this? How could we possibly give it to artificial intelligence? And it turns out to be a really really, I'll say it two more times, really, really hard problem. <laughs> because the way we think we do it, which seems so obvious to us, is doesn't actually explain how we do it. And, and getting this, uh, and the fact that we're starting to get the glimmer of real success at, at this in artificial intelligence, and, and it shows us how hard that question really is. So that's just the cognitive side. But Plato is also asking, and I think Gerson brings this out. Yes, but what must the world be structured like such that it is categorizable, right? Like, is it, is it, could, does it even make... So, so again, on one hand, there's the question, how do we categorize? We do this effortlessly, um, unconsciously, which you'll point to a little bit later. But you also have to ask the question, what must the world be like so that it is subject to categorization? And that categorization doesn't just make sense in terms of my mind. I've met a number of um, untreated paranoid schizophrenics. They clearly, when I talk to them, are experiencing and trying to articulate certain elements of categorization and grouping that when I listen to them, I just say, doesn't make sense. You don't have to look all the way to schizophrenia to recognize that. It's very common when somebody sees a pattern, they say, look, and other people say, I don't see it. Okay, so there's a lot of this seeing and not seeing going on. But so on one hand, where do we get this capacity to categorize and why? What, 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 what must the world be like whereby it can it is categorizable? It makes sense to think the world is just sort of an empty canvas and we just sort of cut it up as we would. Or shouldn't we ask how what kind of ontology do we need such that? our categorization is effective. And you know, this has come into modern uh, discourse as here's a, here's a species of this problem. Why does math work so well? And of course, Kant took that up and he gave a, a, an idealistic answer to that. But Plato's trying to answer that question and I admire him for this because I think this is the way for e cognitive science is trying to answer this question. He's trying to answer it from both sides. He's trying to answer what must the mind be like uh, in order, like, what is it doing when it's categorizing? And he's also asking, what must being be like such that, right, these two poles can fit together and we can be in deep contact with reality? And now, now, one of the things that I do a lot of thinking about lately is, in fact, sort of this bipolar world. I don't mean that in the terms of the medical diagnosis. But there's, there, there's the pole that's us, and then there's poles that's the world. And, and in some ways, especially with my God number one, God number two, um, you know, the pole out there is somehow everything or the center of everything. And the pole right here is sort of the center of me. And in order for intelligibility to happen, there needs to be a connection between these two poles. And I think, um, uh, as I said, I think what we're going through right now in cognitive science is a 
a revolution in the framework in which we are realizing that we should be asking those these questions in exactly that dipolar manner. That when we're talking about cognition, we shouldn't be thinking of it as in the head. We should be thinking of it as primarily co-created and between the embodied person and a dynamic environment. So I admire Plato yeah. for that. I think we should seriously reconsider that dipolar approach to that question. So it sounds like the, so there's two topics I wanna uh, latch onto here. One is the ontology and the other is the pattern recognition. So uh, sure. I wanna do the pattern recognition first. Now, I'm glad you mentioned artificial intelligence because <laughs> whenever I try to tell people, you know, why Plato's theory of forms is still relevant, I bring up artificial intelligence and the problem of pattern recognition. Yes. You know, like you can teach yes. any child to recognize a tree quite reliably, but you, but no matter how well you train up until now, at least, no matter how well you train a computer to recognize yes. a tree, you can always present it with a fake tree that it will fail to recognize. And then if you computers are pretty easy to fool. And, and we are actually fairly good at fooling computers. You, you do it all the time when you're trying to get by something, some, some website or something has a little computer gatekeeper. And um, yeah, you know, you, you fool uh, paywalls. The New York Times paywall is pretty easy to fool. Uh, lots of different things out there are fairly easy to fool. If you add that to its training data, you can come up with another fake tree that, that's still, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so we've never taught a computer yet to recognize patterns in the way that uh, a human can. So it's still an open-ended question whether that's actually possible. And, um, you know, I actually like how in your series, The Meaning Crisis, you define the forms as patterns because they're often called yep. Yep. Uh, shapes or forms or ideas. Ideas is the worst translation ever because it... And, and I think in, in many ways, I don't know. I don't know if John was doing this before Jonathan, but I think this is a good example of the work that's being done in this little corner of the universe because what's happening is that John Verveke's language and ideas are coming into myself and Jonathan Peugeot, and Peugeot's languages and ideas are coming into us. And, and so then suddenly we are, I'm going to talk a little bit about consciousness a little later, there, there are sorts, it's not very, it's not certainly not as robust as, let's say, the consciousness of a church or a consciousness of a family or a consciousness of a team, but the, the, the shared consciousness that is sort of coming together from the three of us, then, okay, so forms are more like patterns rather than ideas, let's say. Didn't mean idea back yeah. then. But forms are yeah, shapes. exactly, exactly. So I guess let's just quickly agree on what the forms are. There are these uh, patterns of things that we experience in our world, which are unlike the, the physical instantiations of them, they are fixed and eternal. So for example, there are many different things that are just, but there's only one pattern of justice that they all partake in. And to the degree mm -hmm. to which they partake in justice, that's how just they are. There's many beautiful things, but only one pattern of beauty. There's many harmonious things, but only one pattern of harmony, etc. cetera. Um, so given, yeah, I guess, do you think that this failure of, or the, the hitherto failure of uh, computers to achieve pattern recognition might in a way point that to, you know, Plato being onto something or at least highlighting a real cognitive problem? Yeah. <laughs> Overwhelmingly so. Um, and uh, this goes into uh, the core of my uh, sort of scientific work, which is the work I do on relevance realization. Um, and um, how, how, how can I summarize this in like a couple <laughs> of sentences? The, 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 here, here's what AI the AI revealed. What, what, what's the problem? And it was a problem that is masked by the success of our meaning-making machinery by our intelligence. See, the, 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 thing, the, thing that we, the thing that our embodied brain, as it's dynamically coupled to the environment, does is render 
things obvious to us. And people therefore think that the explanation just comes from that obvious. Well, how do I categorize? I just look out and notice that some things are similar and I group them together. And then I keep the dissimilar things outside of the category. What could be easier than that? Right, try to and then tell me what you're doing when you're doing similarity. So, so we can think of this along the lines of lineage as in the Peugeot-Weinstein conversation. How do I categorize? Well, somewhere in my lineage, categorization has come down to me. It might be analogous to someone who sits down at the piano and plays the piano. Say, how do you play the piano so well? I just sit down and I just play it. Now, one person isn't going to some. One person might say, I started playing the piano when I was very young. I had a lot of lessons. I enjoyed it. I practiced a lot. I'm asked to play often, so I play quite often. And so I just sit down and I play the piano. Now, all that is within one lifetime. But all this pattern recognition, that's all, well, there, there's, a, there's a lineage, and we're going to talk about whether that lineage is purely horizontal or if there's any verticality to that lineage. There, there's, there's lineage by which I recognize patterns. Because if you mean a list of shared properties, this is a point Goodman brought out, any two objects have an indefinitely long list of truly shared properties. A plum and a lawnmower, are they similar? Well, they both have shiny surfaces. They both contain carbon. They both have an odor. Neither one existed 300 million years ago. Both are found in North America. Neither <laughs> one makes a particularly good weapon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you go, oh, well, I don't mean those. And then I say, oh, but they're true. And you go, yeah, yeah, but they're not the relevant, oh. What? And how do you tell, how do you know what the relevant factors are for comparison? So this is at the guts of categorization. And then, you, and then you're tempted to say, well, it's obvious because of the context. And then I'll say, what do you mean by context? And you'll say, uh, how thing, oh, how things are relevant to a particular problem. Oh, and what's a problem? Is a problem a state of affairs in the world? Well, no, that's not quite right. Is it a state of affairs in your head? No, a problem is a way in which you're not fitting reality. So you're trying to your brain is trying to evolve dynamically how to be appropriately fitted to this situation to solve some problem. And what it's doing is trying to determine out of all of the information, and now this is the other part of it, the amount of information, think of all of what you could pay attention to right now. You could, you could pay attention to the number of green books behind you right now. You could do that. You could pay attention to whether or not your right big toe is a little bit warmer than your left big toe. You could do that. And you go, well, it's, not, uh, it's obvious that I shouldn't do that right now. Yeah, but how do I give that to a machine? Out of all of the information available to it, and now more, out of all of the information in long-term memory, and all the possible ways you could combine it, of all the different thoughts you could have above and beyond what you pay attention to, and of all of the different sequences of behavior you could put together, you zero in on the relevant information and you're doing it and you're categorizing things and it's all happening in a way that fits together and fits you to the world and the world discloses itself to you in such a way that you can causally interact with it. Now, now I'm going to add some C.S. Lewis miracles because not only are you doing this sort of innocently, unconsciously, you're also doing it in a direction to achieve a, pers a particular desire, outcome, telos, fulfillment. And that is, in C.S. Lewis's Miracles, that is sort of what reason is. It's the directionality of all of this, because it's not just, oh, the, the relevance isn't just the relevance with respect to the context, the relevance given to us by a lineage, it's the relevance pointing us in a particular place that we want to or desire to go. And even the selection of that desire is also has relevance realization built into it. In a perspicacious and largely successful manner. That's the problem. And if, so, and, and, and so what, what Plato is trying to, I think, get us to see is we... We need, we need, well, I would say, we need to realize on Plato's behalf that that question is a question that bears tremendous reflection. 
instead of being satisfied with the obviousness of our intelligibility, step back, and this is what cognitive science does, and call it seriously into question. Because when you try and give that ability to a machine, you realize, oh, wow, I don't know how we do this. And then Plato's trying to say, okay, now look, there's bottom-up aspects to this. Let, let's do, like, let's just do your attention. Just do your attention. Mm -hmm. Because part of what you have to do is you're paying attention to what's relevant or irrelevant. Now, part of your attention is bottom-up. If I clap my hands, that's salient and grabs your attention. But notice you can make things salient by directing your attention top-down. How's your left shoulder doing? Oh, now it's salient to me. There's a bottom-up <laughs> and top-down. Uh, you yeah. see this when people are reading, right? All of that's going on simultaneously. This is what I mean. The, the now, now notice his bottom up and top down. Now we're getting sort of into my upper and lower registers. Bottom up is, oh, my toe is hurting. Top down is, how's my toe feeling? Now what's, what's up and what's down? Down is sort of this emergent property coming from the nerve endings in my body all the way to my brain, which is up. And top down is, oh, it's three o'clock. It's time to take the medication for my toe that was in the lawnmower accident because I couldn't effectively distinguish between a lawnmower and a plum. Um, <laughs> I love that illustration. The plum and the lawnmower. What do they have in common? <laughs> and and it's funny because of course this is this is this is built into us. So you have up you have bottom up. Ow, my toe is hurting. Why is my toe hurting? Oh, look, there's a um, there's a cat biting my toe. Top down, well, the, the, the cat, the toe that was bitten by the cat and infected, I took some acetaminophen so that the pain is gone, but I better check the wound. Top down, bottom up, lower register. Well, what's lower register? It's earth, it's flesh, it's matter. What's upper register? It's heaven, it's spirit, it's mind. Okay, upper and lower register doing some of that mapping on, on John's illustration here. The, the bottom up, top down complexity of how the intelligibility evolves, uh, I think people don't realize that's why it, it is so impressive. And that's why and how I think Plato's thought can be so relevant. Sorry, I went on for no, a bit there, but no, that, that's awesome. I really wanted to get that across. No, that was that was very good. Okay, let's jump into Peugeot's human sacrifice video again and go a little bit earlier than what I played before. And we'll see if in the end that uh, we'll see with a lot of these kind of new atheist uh, types and this kind of new atheist rhetoric is that they often act as if religion is this thing completely set aside in human behavior. And so they create a box called religion and then they look at what's going on there and they they uh, they just see it as some kind of aberration or some kind of strange behavior that humans are having. Okay, this is what I often call religion S. This is a secular person says, well, re regular life, I go to work and I pay my taxes and I pay my, pay my mortgage and I wash my car and I take care of my family and I eat my food and I watch the news and I care about my government and I care about my sports team and I do all of that. All of that is secular. Religious is, do I go to church? Do I pray? Do I participate in sacraments? Do I, um, when something happens, do I think about God? Now, relevance realization comes into this because in Dutch Calvinism, even from when I was in junior high, I remember be sitting in my junior high religion class, I can I can see the room, I can smell the building, I can I can see the teacher, and I heard all life is religious. What? And, but growing up as a religious person in a religious house, going to religious schools, that didn't strike me as anything unusual because my entire life was in fact religious. Of course, all life was religious, but someone going to the public school would say, no, religion is over here and life is over there. Well, there's a fair amount of relevance realization that goes on with respect to this question, because what is relevant? Where are the categories? How does this fit together? And because they don't 
they don't seem to want to connect the ritual, uh, let's say, religious behavior with other types of behavior or other types of regular behavior that humans have, then they find it very strange when other people do that. When I, let's say, if I try to explain how certain behaviors today are akin to sacrifice, I've done this not only in terms of abortion, but in terms of in terms of war, for example, I've talked about uh, how, we'll get, we'll get to it, I've talked about how certain acts in war are very much akin to human sacrifice. Um, and so that's the problem. It makes it very difficult to engage with these types of people because they're not really trying to understand why people would sacrifice in the first place. How did this happen? How did humans start to sacrifice? Once you start to ask those questions... Now, even when you start talking about sacrifice, well, the word has a lexical range far beyond, what you, say, what you mean, an altar? You mean like killing an animal and putting it on a primordial, a primeval barbecue pit and then having someone in a fancy dress come out and say some Latin words over it or some Hebrew words over it or some words from another language over it and then, um, and then, and then maybe take this meat and then give it to people. And we might say, well, that's, well, that's what I do in my backyard. Well, yes, but yeah, there's all sorts of rituals. But sacrifice is also, hmm, we'd really like to buy a new car, but um, Benny's tuition payment needs to be made. So instead of saying, well, I'm going to enjoy a new car that perhaps satisfies things of things of me that I want, I am going to forego the new car so that my son can go to college. Something like I would say, well, I am sacrificing for you. Oh, but that one, that kind of not paying for not getting a new car, that's a different kind of sacrifice than the guy with the fancy dress and the, you know, primeval barbecue and the animal and the fancy words in one language or another questions then all of a sudden you get larger categories of human behavior and you can you're able to understand why it would happen that sacrifice would be developed and why it is delusional it, it really would be a strange delusion to notice that sacrifice is a human universal but that today for some reason we don't do that anymore nobody does that anymore now, if you get to Jordan Peterson's way back in the biblical series, if you go to his biblical series playlist and you go to the last video on that playlist, you'll get to this thing about the resurrection. And he's got a really nice section in there on sacrifice. And sacrifices, and now Peterson's coming at this from a different way than Peugeot does, but Peterson talks about it more as sacrifice is an awareness of the future, that some part of being has to be killed now in order for something to live. I mentioned on the question and answer today that that life is a kind of thing that kills. What do you mean by that? You don't maintain your life without killing. You might say, well, I, I've never committed murder or shot anyone or stabbed anything or anything like that. And say, well, that may very well be true. And I say, well, what about that chicken that you ate? That chicken needed to die so that you could have those nuggets. And say, well, there's no chicken in those nuggets. Okay, fair enough. There's, there's, but there certainly is chicken at KFC or Pollo Loco. Say, okay, well, I'm a vegan. I don't, you know, I don't rob milk from calves and I don't um, take life from chickens. Yeah, but all of that, that whole rice field lost its reproductive capacity because you ate its next generation. Are you saying rice is not alive? No. What do you eat? You eat living things. You don't eat dirt. You don't eat rocks. You eat living things. To live is to kill. Oh. Well, maybe there should be no life because then there'd be no killing. Oh, are you going to go back in time and make sure there's no life in order to what? Because instinctively, automatically, you believe life is higher than the inorganic. Hmm. So how on earth can you have hierarchy or levels with any of this? And we're going to we're going to have to talk about, I mean, Oscar, um, you got, he's another exile. It's, exiles from the Bridges of Meaning Discord server. There are a bunch of them out there, and, and you know who you are. 
but I think we're I think part of the coming back to Neoplatonism, Platonism, and all this talk of hierarchies is we're going to have to have a much we're going to have to continue to have a conversation about being and what on earth we mean with that word because right now the word is you put a capital letter in front of it now it's sort of a special thing you can find that in in Peterson's book being capital B but what what on earth do we mean by being because uh, modernity is passing away and we're 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 now well beyond materiality as being anymore nobody sacrifices and of course nobody uh, uh, participates in human sacrifice because you know we're so evolved that we would never do something like that but i think that's really the blindness of not understanding what sacrifice is what what it's for and so we're going to look at that and see if we can figure out on our side why it is that uh, sacrifice exists now in order to understand sacrifice we really need to go back down into very, very primal categories of what humans do because sacrifice is a very, very, is a large and encompassing uh, category. And several thinkers have been poking at now, now, remember, we already talked about how, well, we are categorizing here, and we certainly are. And Peugeot was doing a tremendous amount of relevance realization over over eons and eons of, of human life. And trying to find solutions at why humans do this. Different uh, theory, uh, anthropologists or, or religious thinkers have tried to kind of figure out why it is that humans do this. Um, and I'm gonna give you my take at it. I don't necessarily think that it's all encompassing, but I do think that it does encompass quite a bit of why it is we could get to, the, get to this. now. We have to go all the way back, all the way to the very bottom of activity of what, uh, an, uh, let's say, what a being with agency does and why it does what it does. And the way that I try to think about it that brings it all together is to understand that most of what we do or possibly everything that a being with agency does has two basic goals. Um, and it has, these goals have to do with identity. They have to do with the notion of being a being rather than not, right? To just... That now, identity is important because identity has a lot of relevance realization and categorization. So the identity of woman um, does... Have, um, do women have belly buttons? Yes. Do men have belly buttons? Yes. Belly button isn't a relative, dis a relevant distinction between men and women. What about genitalia? Yeah, there's relevance there. Men and women have different genitalia. So, bang, there you go. You've got relevance. What is a woman? Well, genitalia is one aspect of that. Now, we're going to talk about beings and levels of being. Well, let's let Jonathan go a little bit more. Just existing as a being is what we have to come down to in order to understand sacrifice. So we understand that when beings act in the world, they act for two major reasons. One is to protect the integrity of my being, and the other is to expand my being. Now, okay, now I want to switch to something here. Now, with my little drawing and my little stick figures here, we have all these little human beings or these little representations of human beings. But um, the family is a being with agency and consciousness. And, and I want to and, and right away you say, no, human people have that. No, but family, there's certainly identity that goes to hold this family together in let's say in this particular family let's see if i can in this particular family here you let's say you have papa and mama and three little ones well you have identity and family and being and there's there's even a being that is protected people will always say well i am going to fight to keep my family that being is threatened. What might that being be threatened from? Well, let's imagine, um, let's see, let's imagine you've got 
some being over here that is a threat to the being of the family. Maybe it's a burglar. Maybe it's a um, home wrecker. That is a, a being that is a threat to this family. And let's say if maybe this is the, the secretary at work and the wife looks at the secretary at work and says to the husband, protect the family. Does that mean he should go out and um, we'll, we'll do what? Fire the secretary? Um, send the secretary to Guantanamo base? Or maybe the husband should just not um, think in a certain way about the secretary that perhaps the wife has fi picked up that the husband is thinking about the secretary. So the family is a being and it has a consciousness. And, and what's interesting is that just sort of like my school spirit illustration, the, we can sort of mind read the consciousness of the family. And depending on our role or identity within the family, let's see the agent arena relationship, the arena is the family, the agent is the father, the agent is the mother. They in some ways participate in the consciousness of the family. But the family has, to a degree, consciousness that sees opportunities and threats and protects it. The children have lesser consciousness of the family, but the children are certainly very aware of the family consciousness. On my question and answer today, I used the example of the wardrobe malfunction at the Super Bowl with Janet Jackson a number of years later, and a lot of people were upset. The being They felt their being of the family was... Um, was threatened by Janet Jackson's boob. They didn't want the children seeing that, and this caused a this caused a massive uproar in a far greater in a far greater being, which let's say a very large being, let's say the Super Bowl audience. On this massive platform, lots of little beings made noise to this level of consciousness saying something is threatening our being. And then, of course, religious leaders, this is part of the corruption of America. And I mean, all of this over the wardrobe malfunction. But you have all of these levels of being. Whoops, I didn't. Uh, I'll have to show you here. You have all of these levels of being and stuff is happening with them. Okay. There's consciousness. You know, I don't remember which, which network it was that suddenly became very conscious of, you know, let's say it's NBC and the Super Bowl half game, you know, halftime game, suddenly this arose to the level of the consciousness of NBC and NBC had to exercise agency and suddenly halftime shows were on a seven second delay. So no matter what kind of entertainer wants to make a name for him or herself, the producers will be able to cut away if there's a wardrobe malfunction. Okay. So, so you have all of these levels of being, and they have agency, they have a degree of consciousness, and, and even, the, even the, the beings that are way down here have levels of consciousness and participate in this consciousness. They are all, in fact, connected. Expand my being can be something like adding body, adding potential. But of course, when we get... And, and in many ways, what Janice Jackson, Janet Jackson wanted to do with the planned... And was it Justin Timberlake? I don't remember who it was. I, I didn't research it before. And I, why on earth this came up? Probably memories of... Um, memories of conversations with my mother-in-law, probably. But... The, the performers in the famous 
wardrobe malfunction saw this opportunity as a way of expanded their being. A little bit of modesty had to be sacrificed in order for the being to be expanded. And whereas I don't think I have ever watched any Super Bowl halftime show because why would I? Freddie likes them, but I didn't even see the infamous one. But I heard about it, and now here some how many years later, I, I bet you if I Google, i got to be a little careful with this. So apparently wardrobe malfunction has grown far beyond the Super Bowl now. Um, and, and so this is, so being, a certain being expanded, and we, we use this language still, the consciousness of the nation changed because of what happened between Janet Jackson and Justin Timberlake. And of course, first they said it was an accident, and then they said it was intentional, and you had sacrifice and being and being expansion, all of that coming into play. It to conscious beings and to higher uh, level beings, we'll see that that also has to do with something like influence. It can also be a more subtle type of expansion, not necessarily also, if not necessarily just a physical uh, expansion, but a more subtle one. And we also can understand that expansion of being, even as something as lineage, you know, as something like my children as an extension of my being and that my children become an extension of me, and so I, I can act in a manner to, to protect and to expand the things that are related to my being. We'll see how that scales up also rather. And, and this is, of course, when the promise that Abraham has given that he will be the father of nations, his being will live on through his children. You say, well, well, what being? And we say, oh, maybe his genetic lineage, yeah. But as I, at the point I made in my video about Brett Weinstein and Jesus versus Genghis Khan, whose being is more successfully gone out throughout the world, Jesus or Genghis Khan? But, but this, is, this is where we get into this question of being, consciousness of being. So I have, let's say, Dutch roots. I have consciousness of my Dutch being, even though I've never been to the Netherlands. This is a very big category, and it, and it goes on and on. Quickly into higher beings, even than humans, in terms of families um, and, and different higher beings. So we get to this basic idea. So why is it that I engage with the world? You know, I either try to, to stop things from hurting me, to prevent things from destroying the integrity of what I am, or I'm also either expanding myself or taking things from the outside and bringing them inside in order to preserve and to expand what I am. Um, so we get now to, because we're going to talk about mostly about sacrifice in terms of killing animals, but there are other types of sacrifice. But we're going to start with there. It makes more sense. So the question is, why do we kill things? You know, why would humans kill things? And when you think about it the way that I explained it, you realize that humans kill things for those reasons. Human, humans kill things either to protect themselves. So, right, there's a predator, there's something attacking me, you know, there's a, there's a mosquito biting me, there's whatever it is that is attacking me. And so I will kill the thing in order to, to preserve my body. Or, or, or as I said, you know, the, um, the wife says to the husband with the young, hot, new secretary that she's seen the husband look at, protect the family. Now, the message isn't to, you know, hire a hitman to get rid of the secretary. It might mean, if you watched Miss Maisel, it might mean um, moving a, um, moving the young, aspiring, good-looking 20-something out and an effective cutthroat, savvy, 50-something in, and marriage protected. Probably. So, so this being goes in, in many, different, many different directions. Now, this morning, I had made sure that my video had posted, and I checked a little email, and I got some email from, from Karen Wong. And she sent me an email, and she said, you've got to watch this video. 
and people will often send me recommendations, but I've known Karen for a few years, and people who are wise understand that if they send me a favorite video every week, but if they send me a favorite video once every two or three years, well, Karen's somewhere between there, but I know Karen's been wanting to talk to this individual for a while. I had no idea who this individual was. Maybe Nate put Karen, Nate Heil put Karen onto this video, but this conversation did not disappoint, and it's very much on point with a lot of what we've been doing. Now, it starts out slow, and as with many things, I didn't appreciate the beginning of the video until I had gotten to the end of the video, and then the beginning of the video made sense. And there's often that kind of dynamic when you're trying to teach someone a new thing. So I'm going to try and at least use some of the wisdom from the end of the video to help the beginning of the video make more sense. And then as we go through it, I think you'll be able to see the importance of this and the relevance to what we're talking about in the other videos today. Yes. Um, <clears throat> in your book, The Vertical Ascent, you talk about this picture of the cosmos as having the center and then the, uh, there we go. Okay, now this picture of the cosmos and even vertical ascent. Now, vertical causation, uh, we really have to pause here and, and I want to explain some of this stuff because for him, this is a picture of the cosmos and, that, and he in fact says it's an icon of the cosmos and he'll use that word a little bit later on in the conversation. Now, it's a circle and a point of light down below and a point of light in the center, okay? And I haven't read the book and... I might be getting his icon wrong, but remember earlier in the video, I talked about this bipolar way of viewing the world. I am in some ways a center of the universe, but most of you would say, well, yeah, well, so am I. In fact, um, Solzhenitsyn said, well, we all sort of are, and that's true, but we know that there is a center of being that is central to being in a greater way, in a higher way than I am. That's represented here. So let's imagine ourselves being this little point, that's you or me, or a, a locus of the universe, and then we are below the center of everything, okay? So let's uh, let's keep going. The center and then the, the margin, the, the perimeter of the circle. And one of my questions is, could we look at this from a 3D perspective and see the center as being the pinnacle? Uh, well, People don't like you messing with their icons. I, I classify it as an icon. And an icon, of course, is a way of presenting uh, metaphysical truth in a very simple, uh, abbreviated visual form. So... Uh, I think we should keep it two-dimensional and uh, try to understand the ontology which it expresses. I, I have a sense that this icon was really known in ancient times. I have a feeling that, for example, the students in Plato's Academy were somehow acquainted with that icon. Uh, it was never written down, so far as I know, but uh, it's... I don't consider it an invention. I, I consider it an icon that is simply there and very helpful if we try to understand the uh, ultimate ontology of the cosmos. Now, now, that's a big claim. And I'll tell you, so I, I, I listened to this when I was doing my levee walk this morning. Of course, I had to pull out my phone and look at this thing because it had to be visual. And when you first said it, it's like, well, this is... but. After having watched the video, I think a lot more of his little icon. Because the cosmos has three parts, a center, an intermediary realm, and a, and a circumference. And all the world that we know through our ordinary life, our five senses, is just that circumference. There's this vast intermediary realm. That okay, now let's slow this down, even though I sped up the video because he's kind of a slow talker, and I know a lot of you watch me faster, so he'll be double fast. He's even a little slow for me. So all of the material world, the materiality is the circumference. So that's the circle. That's the materiality, okay? 
And then there's this intermediary space. We're going to talk about that. If you go back to my sermon from last week on diamonds and you look at Plato's Symposium, well, the diamonds are all the intermediary space. And of course, God is at the center. No, no big spoiler there. We normally do not experience. And then there is a center, which also we normally experience only in a very, very partial way. So it's a symbolic representation of the integral cosmos, which is tripartite. And the, the easiest way to explain why it is tripartite is because man himself is tripartite. Corpus anima spiritus are the Latin words. And so just as we are tripartite, so is the cosmos. And the, uh, the intermediary would be the, the um, how, how would you describe the intermediary? Well, uh, the intermediary is a realm that is subject to the condition of time, but not of space. And now, now that's really interesting because, and, and the more I think about this, I'm, I, I want to get his books. I talked about this in the question and answer. I don't want to just get his books and then not read his books. So I haven't even looked his books up on Amazon yet, but. The intermediary has time, but not space. The circumference is time and space. In, ancient, in the ancient world, that intermediary realm was uh, fairly well known to the, uh, the great philosophers and spiritual figures. But the knowledge of this intermediary domain has almost completely vanished in the Western world. When I... now, now, I don't know if it has vanished because, again, getting back to really where we're going in this little corner of the Internet, these levels of beings we're talking about, let's say the being of a family or the being of a church or the being of a, of a, of a, a modern corporation or the being of a city and the consciousness, and of course, Peugeot talked about that with Verveke and we've talked about that with angels, we have, but but our knowledge of this stuff is sort of suppressed and inhibited by our by by the way in which we have suppressed and tried to annihilate it, but fortunately unsuccessfully. I traveled long ago in India. I noticed that every educated Hindu in conversation, you could speak with him about the so-called Tribhuvana. Well, that's a Sanskrit word, but it means the triple world. So in India, even just a, an educated businessman will talk to you about the Tribhuvana because it is there in that tradition. Now, now, missiologists have noted this for a while, and I've talked about Paul Hebert. Paul Hebert was a missiologist, I believe. He was at Fuller, and he's the one that I have the center set, bounded set from. But, but he's also one who has, so this is, this is sort of this, this middle realm that Hebert talks about here, that pretty much every other people in the world, not the weird Westerners who have had the invite, in the Enlightenment, you have God on top, and then you have this middle. And so Paul Hebert talks about the excluded middle. And, and human beings are really... Um, boundary creatures. We participate in the upper register and we participate in the lower register. And remember, the upper register is mind, spirit, heaven, and the lower register is matter, flesh, earth. All right. And there's this intermediary, and it's interesting that they, um, they participate in time, but not so much. And this is, this is, not so much locale. Now, one of the things, if you start thinking about who the gods were, the gods were, we talked about this in the heroes, uh, saints, the gods were local. So often new atheists will say things like, well, well, Israel's God is like Zeus. No, not really, because there was Zeus of Olympus and there was Zeus of 
when, when Zeus would manifest himself in different places, he'd get, get different names. I, I love this. I love this uh, example from Mary Beard on the founding of Rome. According to the Roman tradition, the Temple of Jupiter, where Cicero harangued Catiline and ate November 63 BCE, had been established seven centuries later by Romulus, Rome's founding father. Romulus and the new citizens of his tiny community were fighting their neighbors, a people known as the Sabines. On the site that later became the Forum, the political center of Cicero's Rome, things were going badly for the Romans, and they had been driven to retreat. At a last attempt to snatch victory, Romulus prayed to the god Jupiter, not just to Jupiter, in fact, but to Jupiter Stator, Jupiter who holds men firm. And, and what you see is that in the ancient world, in, in this paganism, the gods came and went. The gods were here and there. And I was describing this to my men's group the other night because we were reading the book of Daniel we were reading Daniel 2, and Daniel 2 is this great story where Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he tells his wise men, hey, I want you to interpret the dream. And they say, well, tell me the dream. And Nebuchadnezzar says, not so fast. Y'all are a bunch of yes men. You're going to tell me whatever, you know. I, I'm really disturbed by this dream. I need to know the truth. So here's the deal. Tell me the dream and interpret it. And if you don't, this is, you know, if you don't, I will kill you all and destroy your houses, basically meaning I will, you know, take your wives and take your property and destroy your houses. Um, this is what I've decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. How's that for a boss? And they say, oh, great king, we can't do this. Only the gods can do this. And then at that point, Daniel's a little ways down the hierarchy. And then the um, Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon. Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He said, why did the king give such a harsh command? Oh, because of the dream and it really bothered him. And so Daniel goes to the king and says, just give me a little time and I think I'll fix this for you. But don't, don't kill anybody yet, Nebuchadnezzar. Just hang on there. And so then during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. And then you would imagine that the, the story is just going to go full forward into, well, Daniel tells the dream, blah, blah. But no, there's a song. Well, why is there a song? Well, because that's how we are. There's a song. And praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises others up. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. Now, now the big deal about this song is he's singing to God in Babylon in captivity as a slave. And this God of Hebrews is different from the other gods in that he's not like here and there. And I described it as sort of, if you go to um, the Virgin Mary pops in and out of different places. And if you look at sort of the phenomenology of the cults around the Virgin Mary, you'll have La Virgen de Guadalupe, that's that's the the virgin sighting at Guadalupe, and you have La Virgen de Alta Gracia in the Dominican Republic, and that's the the site of Mary showing up there, and they establish an altar to her, and it's in this way that in some ways these these major world religions sort of subsume all these practices. But one of the things that I've I've also been reading. Uh, I've been enjoying Bart Ehrman's The Triumph of Christianity, and yeah, I've got some beefs with some things in the book, but at least he takes seriously this, this radical transformation of why Christianity displaced and subsumed the other forms of religion. And so then when, when atheists will say things like, well, you've got Zeus and then you've got the Israelite God, the Lord, and they're really the same thing. Oh no, they are not at all the same thing. And, and I've talked about that in terms of God number one and God number two in the meta-divine realm. And I've often drawn these, these pictures for my adult Sunday school. So, so here, you know, you've got Zeus up here with the gods here and the diamonds go in between. You've got the people down below. And it's, it's very different from the, the Hebrew conception of, of God, God as arena, God as agent, um, God is agents, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You've got Jacob's ladder going up and down. So there's a lot going on. It's sort of in this in this middle realm, 
And whereas Zeus comes and goes, you've got Zeus of Olympus, you've got, you know, Athena of Athens, and you've got Apollo at Delphi, and, and you can get different Apollos in different places. The It's sort of like object permanence when it comes to theism that, that is embedded with Christianity that they get from the Jews that, that goes out and gets popularized into the world. In the West, there is almost no knowledge of it at all. In the Orthodox Church, there is a certain reference to what they call the aerial world. So they recognize it. They recognize that it's a dangerous place uh, because, believe it or not, demons are this not a medieval superstition. It's a reality. They are there, unfortunately. And that is their native realm, so to speak. Could I uh, ask a kind of a controversial question? <laughs> There's an awful lot of talk nowadays about using psychedelics to, um, to interrogate the spiritual world. It, when people take psychedelics, do you think that they somehow access this intermediary realm? Absolutely. I have no doubt about it. And all I can say is it's a terribly, terribly dangerous thing to do uh, because it's real and the entities that inhabit it are also real. I, I will mention in passing that uh, at one point I met uh, Father Malachi Martin, the famous author and exorcist on a radio program, and somehow the conversation turned to the intermediary realm. And when I said that, he knew all about it. He says, yes, I call it the middle plateau because that's where you do the exorcism. You, you actually communicate with the demonic world from the intermediary realm. So he knew how to access that realm and had done it many, many times in in his exorcisms. So, so the um, one of the things that fascinates me about this icon is that is this idea of the center. Because when you look at, um, well, I'm an artist, so part of the reason I got interested in all this is from the standpoint of art. Uh, boundaries are very, very important because. Um, one of the things that generates creativity in art is having very specific boundaries for yourself. You know, it's the old saw, necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> but if you have tight constraints, then you have to work within those constraints to become more creative. And that led me to this whole idea in uh, biology that one of the things that distinguishes life from non-life is that life has this ability to keep from dispersing it moves towards the center and that's why it doesn't disperse outwards. Everything moves towards the center. So in a cell, it's the center that holds the cell together. And in the cosmos, it's the center that holds the cosmos together. At least that's the way it looks to me. So I wonder if that fits with, with your uh, ontology. Absolutely. And basically my ontology is nothing but Platonism. And uh, so uh, Aristotle himself was a Platonist. So I'm in, in the Greek tradition, I, uh, but I think this is universal. I've made a rather thorough study in my young years of the Vedic tradition, the tradition which was still alive in India when I traveled there half a century ago. And that was basically the same wisdom as you found in Platonism. Um, the point about that center is it, uh, it is really and truly the center of the, of the cosmos because the reality of all real things is right there in that center. It is what in the Western language we might call the eternal world. There's neither time nor space there. And yet the reality of all real things is actually there beyond space and time. And I, Karen, like this icon does really um, express something that truly differentiates Wolfgang's work from almost anybody else's work that you're going to encounter, particularly in the secular world and even in most of the Christian world, which is this idea of hierarchy and levels of being and ontology. So most everything that anybody talks about today is all on the circumference of that circle. And this is where physics operates on the circumference of the circle. So, and, and now, this is going to get a lot clearer as they continue to go through it. Physics would deny that the intermediary world or the eternal world exists because they don't 
those worlds um, now, those worlds were intentionally excluded in the service and in the seeking of knowledge um, cannot be expressed in terms of time and space which is the language of physics right physics is you know uh x1 x2 x3 where are you in space and what time is it right <laughs> let's take a measurement and and you can see some of this from you know some of these some of these lower levels of what we were looking at does a family exist in time and space well yes but it, it's not anywhere near i mean can you can you locate the family? You can locate the members of the family, but the family itself, the family consciousness, isn't located in in one brain. Now, now we've I've seen you know Sam Harris use something like the intersubjective. Well, oh okay. Well, where's that? And and so you know right away, you know it might not be at the circumference, but it's 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 coming in from the circumference, just sort of a just sort of a little bit. That's right. All that happens on the circumference of the circle. So the vast majority of our being and of the cosmos is completely disregarded by physics and by most of the world today. And so uh, this icon is, is very critical to understand how Wolfgang's work is different um, from uh, most everything else, which is Pretty much even, you know, even people who are talking about spiritual themes in kind of a secular context, it's still all on the circumference of that circle and really not um, uh, acknowledging the existence of these other um, ontological domains. Well, so in, in the vertical ascent, um, which this is, that's one of the things this image comes from, it talks about um, the vertical holds primacy um, whereas the horizontal operates laboriously, one might say, by way of a temporal progression through space. I really like that image, um, laboriously. And you very much have the sense of the labor required to, to move horizontally. The fact is that vertical causality derives from wholeness, whereas the horizontal derives from parts. So, so you can, if you think about a family or a church, you think of it as one. Well, this is one family, and you know, Peugeot talked about ident identity. This is a, this is a, this is an identity of a family. It's a thing. Now, we're, we also, when we talk about identity, we're also often talking about these particular skinny aspects over huge swaths of people, and and that's where again, where you get to the the Vervakian categories. Well, where do these categories come from? I wonder if you might talk a little bit about the difference between wholeness and parts and how that works out across all of um, not only physics, but across that whole picture of your iconic tripartite cosmos. Well, first of all, I think it, we, we need to realize that physics and modern science in general, by its very modus operandi, its intrinsic methodology, deals uh, incurably with, um, with parts. In other words, it can conceive of a whole only as a sum of parts. And so the causality, which uh, was... Now, a little bit later, Karen's going to hit him with the Peugeot chair. Well, what, what is a chair? And I did a conversation with Andrea with the bangs where I use this lens cap. And so you have the question, what category and what category is this lens cap? Well, it's a plastic thing. Well, it's an instrument in sort of the photographic realm. Can it be a, um, can it be a, can you put a cup on it so you don't get a ring on your table? Can it be a coaster? Oh yeah, it could be that. Could it be a, a patch for my eye in case, you know, I'm taking maybe a, a, a test a sight test and I have to cover my eye and well, let's cover this eye now. Yeah, it can be that too. So what exactly is this thing? So now you have this question of this question of category and, but, but it's the whole, well, this is part of my photographic equipment. Which physics operates is it can conceive of a whole only as a sum of parts. And so the causality, which uh, with which physics operates is a causality emanating from the parts 
and okay now we might we might clean this up and say causality emerging from the part so this is horizontal causation and and so when we were talking about biology or electroceuticals or you have these little parts and so then you have this emergence up but well really you can't say acting upon holes because physics really has no con no ontological conception of wholeness the only wholeness physicists deal with is and and so what you have let's say with biology is you have pvk smuggling that my person paul vanderclay gets smuggled into it because biology or physics or you know i go to the doctor about the most so i just went to the doctor this week because you know checking things etc cetera, etc cetera. and how are you feeling that's about it in terms of questioning about the whole is i feel great that's all he needs to know well now let's check the details let's check your blood pressure let's check your blood work let's look at your cholesterol level let's look at um let's look at your weight so let's look at all of these parts because the idea is that all of those parts um, make me, you know, make into the whole. Now, let's say if I was depressed and, and he said, well, how do you feel? What you do you mean physically? Yes, physically. I feel great. But let's say I was not telling the truth that I'm severely depressed and I am planning my own demise. Yeah, I can have the best cholesterol numbers and the best, best blood pressures, but now suddenly we have the tension between the upper and the lower. And, and what exactly is he asking me with how are you? Well, physically I'm doing tremendously, but right after this I'm about to go kill myself. Oh, well, um, well that's not my problem. I'm your I'm your primary care physician. Oh, but no, you should, you know, on and on and on and on and on and on. But but you begin to see, okay, what's the perimeter, that part of the ring? Well, that's all this area of emergence. A uh is a sum of parts. So physics is based upon atomization. And it turns out, however, that uh, wholeness does play an absolutely essential role in the economy of life, whether the physicists know about it or not. And along with the idea of holes, there is a corresponding causality, which I call vertical causality as opposed to horizontal causality. So so maybe vertical causality is the way that my cells and my diet and all of those, all of those different parts are, are caught coming into my cholesterol numbers or my blood pressure or how I'm feeling right now, if my body feels well. Vertical causality well, let's say I, I didn't protect the family and I went chasing the secretary and the wife hates me and she took the kids and they've all left me. And now after I leave the doctor's office, says, oh, your numbers look good. And I'm about to do something to end all those numbers. Well, it's coming from above. Remember the Verveke thing? Well, you know, either, you know, all of these parts... How do, you, how do you feel? Well, the cat just bit my toe that's coming from below. And so you go to the doctors, how is your toe doing? Now it's coming from above. And I first introduced this idea of vertical causality in the context of physics. The new physics came in in 1926, quantum theory. And uh, very soon, physicists realized that there is something very puzzling about quantum theory because a quantum system in its own right is a very, very uh, strange, bizarre uh, uh, thing. I mean, for example, if you have a quantum particle, it will not be located in general in any particular point in space. In fact, there's a probability that it is in given any two regions in space, so there's a certain probability that the particle is in that region. Okay, now that's a little confusing when he says it. The, the question of measurement and locality, they can say, well, there's, without measurement, that the particle can be in any of these two regions. Okay, and so there's, 
Where he's like, well, we don't like that. That's against our intuitions of this, this big physical world that we're used to interacting with. So these quantum particles are very, very uh, strange entities. You, you can't really conceive of them except in mathematical terms. But what puzzled physicists is that when they make a measurement in an instant, as it were, this particle, uh, instead of being spread out over vast regions of space, obtains a particular position. The measured particle is in a given place and time. Now, now we talk about that in terms of observation. When something is observed, well, even the observation of it changes it. And so he just gave an example of that right here. And so this is something that puzzled the physicists. How is it possible for an act of measurement to collapse this probability wave and give a definite position to particles which have no definite positions before the act of measurement? And believe it or not, physicists have been kicking this so-called measurement problem around for a good hundred years, almost, <laughs> more like 90. For about 90 years, they've been speculating on this with no actual solution in sight. The weirdest ideas are presented by them uh, in order to resolve this conundrum, but uh, I believe it's still open an open question in the physics world. So this is what got me into thinking about quantum mechanics. And I came to a very simple conclusion the, the reason measurement is not comprehensible to the physicist is that the measuring instrument itself is not really a physical thing. It is not the kind of thing that the physicist studies or, or describes in his equations. It is what I call a corporeal entity. So there is a difference between a corporeal entity and a physical ob an object. Now, now, this gets a little confusing here, too. A physical object is something that is of the realm of physics. Now, remember the circumference of time and space. Okay, so you can locate it. You can locate it in time and space. A corporeal entity is known by appearance. Now, if you go back to my question and answer today, I talked about Barfield's example of the, of the rainbow. Where is the rainbow located? You would say, well, I see the rainbow up there in the sky. Is that where the rainbow is? If I quickly send a drone up into the sky, am I going to be able to interact with the rainbow? Well, not exactly, because I see it up in the sky, and we'll all say, oh, look at the rainbow. Where? It's over there. Is the rainbow over there? The rainbow appears over there. Now, if I were to say, well, because I can't take a drone and locate it in space. Now, it's in time. But in space, the rainbow does not exist. How about the family? Does the family exist? Of course, the family exists. Father, mother, sister, brother. But does the family exist in them? No, it's sort of among them. What if they all die? Does that family still exist? Well, yeah, it's also sort of a lineage. Well, let's say they have no more children. Does the family still exist? Well, that depends what you mean by exists. Because the family used to exist, and in some ways, the family still does exist. And so, we again, we begin to get at this question of, well, what is is? What do we mean by this? Because where is the rainbow? Well, the rainbow, obviously, you have the sun and the droplets of water and the refraction, and so you see the rainbow. Is the rainbow in my mind? Is the rainbow in the sky? Is the rainbow a corpus? And the difference, basically, is that the corporeal entity is perceptible. If you think of the visual perception, it has color, it has qualities. Uh, and we perceive it. So I realized that what had happened is that the physicist had abstracted from the perceivable world. The perceivable world is real, it's not an imagination. The red apple is there and it's red and we perceive it. But to the physicist, the red apple has become 
a res cogitans, a thing of the mind. So what happened is that in the 17th century, Western civilization became, as it were, controlled by one philosopher, René Descartes. Uh, he introduced a very actually weird philosophy and uh, it gained traction. It became the philosophy which scientists and especially, of course, physicists absorb, as it were, without knowing that it is a philosophy. They think it's just the way it is. Oh, Rene Descartes, Cartesian dualism, our little friend that we bump into all the time. And uh, so I realized that the reason that this measurement problem continues to mystify physicists to the present day, and you should see some of the theories they evolve in order to explain it, it's, uh, it, it becomes really weird. And the reason that the physicist can't resolve that problem is that uh, he has fallen victim to this Cartesian philosophy. And in the Cartesian philosophy, uh, there are no corporeal entities because all qualities are relegated to the mind. So they cut, as it were, he cut the world into two parts, res extense, extended entities on one side, and all they are is their quantities. They are, they are, so to speak, the world as a physicist conceives of it. That's on the outside. And everything else, everything that's not a res extensa, was, as it were, postulated to be a res cogitans, so a thing of the mind, a thing of thought. So René Descartes cut the world into these two pieces. And this has become, so to speak, the underlying philosophy, which everybody who goes into physics absorbs unknowingly. And it is really unknowingly because I find that when I try to explain what Alfred Noah Schwartzman called bifurcation, this cutting of reality into two pieces, the mechanical and quantitative, and the rest is all supposed to be mental, uh, to the physicist, this is not this. Now, this is this is also important because I think again, part of the meaning crisis is the absorption of the phys of the basically the properties of the mental from the physical. So, in other words, with the whole show from C.S. Lewis's Miracles, well, all my mental properties and experiences are also simply from the physical, products of the physical, mechanistic, all the way up until me. Theory, this is the way things are. And when you try to explain it to him, he doesn't really understand it because he doesn't know any other way of, of, of uh, conceiving the world. So what I'm saying is that in Western civilization, the intellectual class has uh, typically been victimized by this Cartesian philosophy. They accept this, not as a philosophy, but as simply the way things are. And uh, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a very tragic thing because, first of all, it makes life tragic. Just think, uh, when a father or mother uh, holds a child, according to Descartes, they're holding a race extensor. All that there is outside in space and time is a mechanism. It's a terribly tragic way of looking at life. And of course, I fully believe that it is false. But I'm, the point that I'm, that I'm making is that the world of science has been duped by this bifurcationist Cartesian philosophy. So they think of the world as greatly reduced. And uh, what I uh, marveled when I began thinking about the so-called measurement problem is this, that as soon as you step out of this Cartesian way of looking at the world, the solution of the measuring problem is very, very simple, childishly simple, because the measuring instrument is corporeal. That means it is perceptible. It owns qualities. You can see it. You can touch it. I can't wait till Sevilla sees this. She's going to jump all over this. Uh, you can hear it um, give sound. Incidentally, if it weren't perceptible, it couldn't measure anything because measurement is a matter of seeing, say, a number on a screen. So uh, what has happened is that 
our men of science and especially men of physics uh, have been duped by a philosophy which uh, is totally imaginary, it is totally off course. And incidentally, the interesting thing is that in essence, this Cartesian philosophy was enunciated long, long by a pre-Socratic known as uh, Democritus. Democritus, yes. <clears throat> so Democritus, before Plato, <laughs> pre-Socratic said that all the people vulgarly think there's the sweet and the bitter, in other words, there's a perceptible, but in reality only atoms and the void. So this is the philosophy which the Platonist and Aristotelian schools completely disproved, disqualified. They were smart yeah, enough to recognize <clears throat> that this is just a fantasy, but it is this very same philosophy of uh, Democritus. Democritus, thank you. Same philosophy that emerged again in the 17th century uh, through... And you have to wonder if it emerged or if it came down. René Descartes. And well, it could, we, could, we, could we take a look at this, uh, what you were saying about the measurement, the, uh, the measuring equipment being perceptible? Um, I think what you're saying... Now, now, Karen's going to insert some language from this little corner of the internet, and she's going to start connecting the dots for us. Thing is that it is not a quantum mechanical measuring system. Therefore, you're working in two realms. You Measurement itself is not within physics. Something measures. Something is coming vertically down below, and you can. So, if you go back. Well, we can go back because of the magic of YouTube. So, but I think you're misunderstanding what I mean by by faith or by the jump of level. All right. So let let let's take let's take the the DNA for example. So you have you have a bunch of stuff, right? I'm not a scientist. You have a bunch of stuff. You have a bunch of acids. You have a bunch of stuff that's there, and then then all of a sudden you are able because we're conscious beings. You're able to perceive a pattern. That pattern is repeated in different cells, but that pattern has an existence of its own because you can abstract it and you can model it. And so it doesn't only exist in the cells. It has, it has an invisible existence, a pattern, a pattern existence. And so that pattern is an unseen in the sense that it's not a bunch of stuff. It's a pattern of a bunch of stuff. And, and I think I would alter because he keeps saying it's unseen. I, I think in a little bit more metaphorical, you're and you're going to look above and you're going to see the pattern. That's the measurement. You're you're going to a different level now. Now Brett later will sort of implement this because he says, well, the genes have this have this evil agenda that they're pursuing, but we have consciousness, so we can rise above and we can choose between the genes. Well, all of that is this verticality that they are talking about in this in this video and karen's gonna say it you have the you have the quantum realm but then the measuring system is in another realm yeah. it's a level up right and and then not only that but the measuring equipment has been designed and that's a level up and then it's being utilized by that level which is a level up from that so so just by virtue of the 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 whole system of measuring you can see that there is a hierarchy. It's not flat, right? Is that, is that partly what you're saying? You, you've got the point perfectly and you've expressed it perfectly. Exactly. Um, the cosmos is hierarchic. It breaks up into different levels. And the corporeal level is actually the lowest level in the integral cosmos. It is what is represented by the boundary of that circle. That's where the cosmos comes to an end. And uh, however, the physicist uh, abstracts from that. He does not recognize the corporeal world for what it is. The, the physicist, if, if you go all the way back to a conversation with Andrew, between Andrea and Mercury and Jonathan Peugeot, Peugeot says the physicist is a pattern seeing a pattern. Here, you see the physicist comes above it and looks down at it, but the physicist forgets himself. He forgets that 
there's that that he or she is a pattern looking at a pattern forgets that they have in fact ascended vertically to look down and that there are layers because the assumption is that there are no layers of being Verveke talks about that in the four horsemen that's the assumption of science there are no layers of being it is all simply this and so what you sort of do is you have this sneaky emergence which is all horizontal causality and that's all there is but again as we saw with the measurement problem no by measuring you are in fact exerting physical ca vertical causation onto the phenomena of the location of the particle and that's why it is located. That's what he says. That solves the measurement problem because you have actually ascended and we human beings have this capacity to ascend and look and the very act of observing changes the location of the particle. And that's how the universe is constructed and as is seen by physics and is the answer to the measurement problem. You cannot measure, go all the way back to Verveke, measurement involves a categorization because you are, well, you're using relevance realization to say, well, okay, I walk into the doctor's office, he says, we're going to measure your fingernails today. Oh, are you? Is, uh, uh, okay, we've never measured my fingernails before. Oh, yes, we're... The fingernails are a part of your body. Let us measurement. How about the nose hairs? Have you been clipping them? Because you do do those videos and they do get kind of long. Well, no, he's, we're going to measure your blood pressure. Well, why my blood pressure, not my fingernails? The doctor has risen above. He's using relevance realization. He is categorizing. All of that is part of this vertical causation. It's coming from above. Emily. It's a sensible world, the world we perceive through our five senses. But he abstracts the quantitative part of that. So this is uh, the effect of Cartesian, of the Cartesian philosophy. The physicist is blinded by the Cartesian philosophy. He does not recognize the corporeal for what it is. And uh, so he has lost the whole idea of hierarchy. And he tries to build the world out of these quantitative entities that he has defined by his physics itself defines these entities and so they are not what the world is made of and and i mean that is so abundantly clear in peugeot's conversation with brett weinstein Brett keeps going back, but then suddenly Brett takes this flip, and now he's, I'm on the top of the world looking down on creation, and I'm saying no to gas chambers today. There we have it. Nice little song. But it's like, wait a minute, Brett. You don't even have verticality in your world. Verticality is, is part of this mind. It, it doesn't exist outside of ourselves. No, we participate in verticality. You know, Wolfgang's um, domain is physics, but it's very graphic in biology, right? It's the same principle of life yeah. as a vertical cause on the living organism, right? And now, now, what he just says there is really key. Life is a vertical cause on the organism. Let's imagine me just without life. Well, I got my fingernails. You can measure them. You know, well, maybe I wouldn't have blood pressure, and it, but 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 all of the stuff would be here. Well, what what is what is life? Life is verticality onto. Well, it's God making a man out of the clay and breathing into the man, and he becomes a living nefesh. He becomes a living being. Man suddenly is up a level the analogy of the physicist and their abstraction process right versus a biologist who's going to literally like you know kill something and try to analyze its parts and figure out how to put the parts back together and make it alive again and it's not possible right and in science today you hear all kinds of conversation about emergence right and emergent properties right yeah. like artificial intelligence and i worked in artificial intelligence for years this was part of what my phd was in and I studied at the Santa Fe Institute. I studied complexity science. I was involved in the field of so-called artificial life. How do we create the right, you know, um, algorithms and conditions in a computer with metabolic tax and 
growth and reproduction and look for emergent properties, right? And then this whole thesis today in the world about artificial intelligence and technology that where this is an emergent intelligence is all, you know, coming out of this philosophy that says, let's get rid of the most important things, <laughs> you know, <laughs> go down to this level of abstraction and then try to recreate all the most important things. And that is what we fundamentally reject. And that's this idea of wholeness and parts, which is what you originally asked about, and mm -hmm. vertical causation, right? It's actually consciousness and life and corporeality that affects the lower realms. And it's not the other way around. You can It's the upper register and the lower register. It's it's well, I got asked questions about the Gospel of John. Jesus says, I'm born. Jesus says, you know, you must be born from above, Nicodemus, in order to what? To level up. We use that language in our video games. You cannot reduce. You cannot abstract and reduce your way back to creation and to life. And that is the fundamental error of science, scientists, scientism, scientism, scientism. Yeah. <laughs> it's easy to get these words all mixed up, right? And I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. And we, I mean, we certainly see the effects all around us with the nihilism and the depression and the anxiety that's yes. overtaken young people because of the loss. Meaning crisis, of course. Uh, Karen is a is a very astute observer of everything going on in this corner of the internet. And even though, at least in my corners, her meaning code channel is is pretty important. The 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 quiet, careful work she does with a variety of people. Um, it's, it's not a, it's not a very big channel. It's not the smallest in this little corner of the internet, but it's by no mean a, means the largest in culture. Yes. A loss of meaning. And, um, um, one of the, one of the quotes that, um, Wolfgang brought up in the vertical ascent is from a, a philosopher named Jean Barella. And oh, I yeah. thought this was just excellent that appearance is the image and revelation of being. It, it conceals this only if we idolize it, attributing to it a reality for which it is unsuited. So we've talked on my channel quite a lot in the past about the difference between an icon and an idol. That an icon is something that you can look into deeply and see beyond it, but an idol is when you take it for itself and then begin to begin to worship it. But you said you the quote here is that appearance is the image and revelation of being. And I mentioned to you earlier. Um, Jonathan Pajot, the Eastern Orthodox thinker, he's always talking about wholeness in terms of if you take, for example, a chair, a chair in essence has many parts, but we don't look at it as the parts. We see only the whole. We see the whole. Um, <clears throat> there's something that, that we are attributing to it that gives it this wholeness. And part of that may be what that we see it as something to sit in, but also it's made up of all, you know, this physicist would tell us it's made up of all these particles. It's made up of all the molecules and all the elements that are in it. And it's made up of uh, arms and, and legs and a seat and, and, and nails and whatever all else goes into making a chair. And yet when we look at it, we see it as a whole, which is not too different than looking at an apple and seeing an apple as a whole thing that has color and taste and, and seeds within it that are going to sprout and become a tree and make more apples and, we, we have the capacity to conceive it as a whole. And that very thing about how we, how we give something identity, that is a very mysterious thing. But, but you have said here that appearance is the image and revelation of being. So I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit more. <clears throat> well, let me first of all say, I'm glad you mentioned um, Jean Borella. He is perhaps the deepest metaphysician of the 20th century, and I, I say this advisedly, and he has grasped the uh, metaphysics of Plato and the metaphysics of the great uh, Christian metaphysicians. He has grasped this perhaps more deeply than anyone else, and I have been, I have profited from Jean Borella. Uh, he has helped me greatly to understand certain things. But getting back to wholeness, the fact of the matter is that even ordinary things, such as a chair, as you say, receives its wholeness from the center of that icon. This is something and that's an interesting, so 
where does the where does the relevance realization where does the categorization come it comes from the center of the icon that's that circle with the little circle below and then the circle in the center something mind-boggling because when we speak of this eternal realm the realm of platonic ideas what have you it sounds so mystical so mysterious which it is uh, granted that but it is also a fact that uh, the everyday things that we know and deal with in our ordinary life receive their actual reality from that central point, that eternal realm, uh, call it whatever you will. And this is something that is, in principle, inaccessible to the physicist. The physicist, if I were talking now to a physicist, he might well say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Because as a physicist, he, one cannot conceive of that wholeness. Because the way the physicist understands anything that he thinks he understands, the way he understands is by decomposing something into parts. Ultimately, they are sort of atomic parts. But this, even in classical physics, the, the, the modus operandi of physics is based upon cutting things up into little pieces. Uh, it's, it's amazing how much actual empirical knowledge you can get that way. I mean, all of our technology is based upon it. So I'm, I'm not saying that there is an invalidity here. No, there's not an invalidity. There is just a limitation. There are things that can be understood that way, but they are, there are also other things which actually are of prime importance that cannot. So wholeness precedes parts and the the cosmos think about the family the wholeness of the family precedes the parts okay the family certainly there are elements of the family there are parts of the family but the identity comes from the whole where does the whole come from the whole doesn't really emerge from below they're just individual just let's just take five random people and call them family no it's not. There's a story. There's a process. There's something that comes from above. And even the name, there it's, it's coming from above. Is not just an assembly of, of entities. It is a hierarchy. There's a verticality. There's a vertical order, which uh, we humans should understand because there is that vertical order in ourselves. We have the corporeal nature. We have the psychic nature, and above the psychic, we, we have a spiritual nature, call it what you will. It is precisely in the arts that this wholeness plays a key role. Uh, I have often, in my writing and trying to explain these things to, uh, to a general audience, referred to music especially to indicate the integral wholeness of a mu musical composition. We, we don't say... Well, let's play da 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 No, you say the song. Uh, it's, it's not just an assembly of notes. There's a wholeness there. And I often quote to people something that Mozart said. Mozart confided once to a friend that an entire symphony comes into my mind all at once as one thing. And then it may take him weeks and weeks to unpack it into the scores for the different instruments and so on and the different movements. But the point is that a real symphony, uh, say, is more than the parts, more than the notes. And uh, this is, of course, why it's beautiful and why we uh, sense very deep meaning in it. But the point is that this wholeness precedes the division. So the point is not only that the physicist cannot understand everything, but the point is that what he can understand is, so to speak, the bottom of things. And this has, of course, has had a tremendous cultural impact upon the contemporary Western civilization because the dominant force in contemporary Western civilization is science, and the basic science is physics. So the fact that the fact is that modern Western culture has, as it were, uh, eliminated all the higher levels of being. And uh, I mean, we've become sort of uh, creatures of the mud. We're crawling around on the earth. 
See? I, I think that's a genius way of saying it. We have become creatures of the mud. I think that's all there is. So the blessed thing about modern physics is that nobody really believes it. I'm sure that no parent, uh, when it uh, holds its child, thinks that it's holding a bunch of molecules. I mean, not even the physicists go that far. But and, and right away when I started with the Jordan Peterson thing, somebody, and I don't know if he's still watching me or watching this video, but he called me. He didn't live far from here and said, I want to do lunch. I said, okay, let's do lunch and met him and he actually was on my channel some of my very early randos videos and he told me he said you know i i was a christian i was in a christian house i was even studying to be a minister and basically the weight of this view of the world overtook him and he threw away his faith and became a secular person without religion and then he got married, and then he had a child. And he said, I, I simply cannot imagine my child is the physical equivalent of a rat. You know, I don't care if I have rats in my home, I'll poison them. I will protect my family from the rats. My daughter, my daughter is my daughter. What wouldn't I do for my daughter? There's there's a there's something there's a verticality to my daughter that the rat does not possess. And I don't have a system that accounts for it. And in fact, I'm living in a system that says we ought not to account for it. Yet sometimes we say we ought. We're we're terribly conflicted and we don't know what to do. We're crawling around in the mud. And fortunately, we don't believe what our systems say we are. Because if we did, well, we would have a meaning crisis. But yet, in a sense, that would be the logical consequence. So the reason uh, we founded this foundation, Philosophia Initiative Foundation, is because we recognize that this reductionism of contemporary science is uh, not only wrong, but it is uh, dangerous, it is destructive of all higher culture. I mean, uh, it, it, it really shows the resilience of mankind that it has been able to withstand that absolutely poisonous philosophy coming in the name of science and still retain its humanity with, with all the, the limitations that we see daily. We are still human beings and that's, that's a marvel because if we would fully believe what quote-unquote science tells us these days, we would be ipso facto dehumanized. So you see, uh, what we have to say and what we want to distribute uh, far and wide is uh, not only a, a philosophy of physics, which has technical things to say, but we are interested in the cultural implications. And it's nothing short of turning the world right side up again. We're living in, a, in, a, in an upside down world. Well, I, I really enjoy all of your work and what you're trying to do through the foundation and, uh, <clears throat> and applaud it. And I, I also noticed that in the, in the book, Ancient Wisdom, you um, were talking about some of the issues that have been coming up in the biological realm in terms of evolutionary theory. And then you mentioned William Dembski's um, work on complex specified information and Michael yes. Fahey's idea of um, irreducible. And, and they'll go for, they'll go for a while. So, you know, it's an hour and 20 minutes. Karen's video, the link is below. Um, you should definitely watch it. It's again, Karen was right to be tremendously excited about this conversation. And right away this morning, I think I was the 22nd person. I, somebody had I said somebody had already made a comment, so I couldn't be first, I think. But I, I saw it right away, and I started listening to it on my walk, and I thought, that's right, that's right. And I meant, remember, this guy is, he's a physicist. Okay, vertical causation. Physics is sort of moving around in the mud. 
I'm out of time. That's all there is. There's no rough draft this week, so I'll just post this on Saturday morning instead of the rough draft. I know some of you will be like, where's the rough draft? Well, I didn't have to preach this week, so if I didn't have to preach, I don't have a rough draft. And I don't have a Sunday school lesson this week either, so no adult Sunday school for Sunday either. Um, Stuff going on at church, and so uh, Sunday school will come the week after. So thanks for watching. Leave a comment.